he's, he's from Paris. Um, somebody saw him down there, brought him up to the United States. Um, he got an education, uh, went to uh, college in uh, Tennessee, and then went to Europe to play professional basketball. And I have a daughter that lives in Boston, and they had a mutual friend, and she met him one night, and um, she called me, and we connected via telephone, and I flew out a couple months after that to meet him. And um, so they're kind of helping us to go through the process of all the certifications and, and things that you need in Haiti to build a school and keep it running. Um, so anyway, welcome to Pierre, and um, he's going to talk to you. Well, Pierre Valmera uh, from Port of West Haiti. I am one of those kids, you know, like by watching some of these houses, I remember that's my that's my environment. And um, I'm gonna I'm a talker, so if I talk too much, please stop me. <laughs> <laughs> so my story started like this. I was in uh, I don't know if I have to call it a park, like in the area where we're playing basketball. And there is a, an American guy, I don't remember, he's a missionary person, who's actually from Jackson, Tennessee, who saw a group of Haitian boys playing around and none of us speaks English, you know, but the guy kind of figure out when you desperate every time we always, in Haiti, every time we see like a white person, we say, ah, let's we call it blanc. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, we all what did the white man say? Because we all very excited. But this guy tried to look for us, you know, and he get my information. He says something about Haitian it was in Tennessee. I kind of figured maybe he might know some Haitian person who lived in Tennessee. I give my information, he take all of all of our information, but he was really impressed to see uh athletic we were. And but one thing he while he was watching all of us, there was some of us who wasn't wearing like sneakers. And I was one of this I was one of the kids, you know. I don't know if you see the picture, the video I show you today of that kid dunking with that shoes. That was me. But he's looking at, at athletic, long, he asked me how tall I am, I didn't even know how tall. And he said, Well, don't worry, I'm gonna make some phone call. He went back to Tennessee and by giving all my information, I was lucky enough at our house, we have a telephone, we have a phone. I received a phone call, the guy that called, his name is Robert Joseph, Haitian kids, who was playing at Union University of School down in Jackson, and he Robert called, I said, hey, I heard about you, I'm gonna be in Haiti in a couple weeks, I would like to, to meet some of you guys. <coughs> Robert's come down, that's after the, uh, the guy talked to Coach David Niven, who's in Jackson, Tennessee. That was my college coach. Coach Niven was an assistant coach at this time. But Robert, he actually was doing something incredible at Union. Great student. The guy had 242 blocks in just 35 games. Yes. Even though you want to help somebody, but that Haitian guy right there opened a the gate. He said, wow, if he can do this, maybe let's try to see if we can find some other athletes in Haiti. But they want to help or so much, they didn't care about how good we are. The coach said, hey, hey Robert, go to Haiti, see if you can find me something to work with. <laughs> Robert comes to Haiti, he met me, he makes some short little video, cassette, he went a guy with his big, bigger than this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make a small video, and Robert was really impressed with something. The goal wasn't 10 feet, it was 12. And we, I wasn't the only one guy who was be able to dunk the ball. All the kids, all the some of us, were dunking on the ball who was like 12 feet tall, not 10. <laughs> because in Haiti, if you have a basketball goal, you want to protect it because you don't know when you're gonna get another goal. You can't have a bunch of guys come and keep dunking on the ball because you have to raise it, raise it really high. And by by going most of your time trying to reach out that level to dunk the ball, we end up getting some of them end up being very athletic, <laughs> you know, and Warbeck went to Union, told Coach Union about what he saw, and um, I remember 
Because even, I remember a couple years after I was at uni, he said, Pierre, when I see that video, I'm like, man, why am I getting myself into I'm going to get fired. But he's going to bring a guy over who don't know much about the game. Story short, Coach even called my house after what they showed me everything and said, hey, Pierre, we give you a full scholarship. Here's a guy that called my house, no one speaks English. I don't even know what school full scholarship was. No clue, no idea. If I told you guys, <coughs> It take me next day to figure out who have an English dictionary to, mm. <laughs> to figure out what is scholarship. I know something special happened that I'm going to die you know? you know? and, and get scholarships, come to America. For Haiti, the Haitian give me like a nickname. They call me Titanic. <laughs> and Titanic for a Haitian kid, you know, for, for Haiti, if you were size 13 for Haitians, that's really big. I always say God had a plan for me to be here because I was size 17. And if they take me out of the island, I will be walking barefoot because no one were that size. I had a size 15 and a half, 16. I had it for a while. But before I came to America, I, you want to show up in your best dress. This is the story, guys. I never wore a pair of jeans before because I never had one. My mom had a friend who gave him a nice pair of jeans to give me, a nice t-shirt to wear. But I decided I need to clean up my sneakers before I get on the flight the next day. I clean up my shoes, super clean, you know, put it on top of the roof. Man, my flight was at 10.30 a.m. Haitian never, we were late for everything, but when it comes to coming to America for the airport, we did there four hours before. <laughs> you know? So I get up at 6 a.m. I thought somebody was playing with me. I said, Mom, where are the sneakers? They gone. Mom said, what do you mean they gone? And I asked my brother, I said, Wilder, where's my shoes? He said, Pierre, like, what do you mean where's your shoes? I said, dude, my flight is at 10, I don't have shoes. But kid who had it worse, think about it. you size 17, nobody in your neighborhood wear your size, and there is not a store where you can go to be able to get a pair of sneakers. Even if there is a store, we don't have that money, the kind of money to get a pair of sneakers. The kids stole it. And I have a friend who was size 13 who let me wear his shoes on the same old. Like, so when I, he didn't give me his best pair because the guy don't have a lot either. So when, we lay, when I laid it to Fort Lauderdale, the bottle of that, whatever I was wearing as a sandal, came off. And there is an American guy who speaks perfect Creole. In Haiti, we put a label to everything. If, if you have red hair, we're going to call you red. You, you, have, you know, whatever. I see this. White kids speaking Creole, I was very impressed. I'm like, oh, wow, that's the... And we start talking, I say, hey, man, like, my shoes just come. He said, dude, listen, what are you coming to America for? I show him my twenty. He said, look, no one's going to pay attention to you. You're not wearing shoes. He gave me some clean white socks. I put it on my feet, and when my college coach picked me up from the airport, I wasn't wearing shoes. <laughs> and that right there, my self-esteem was very low. But I was very lucky to have, like, a very, very nice man who picked me up from that airport. Coach Niven is like my second father. He's the reason I'm where I'm at today. He never gave up on me. When I landed to school, I wasn't the tallest. I know this guy was giving me a chance because there were six, nine, six, ten guys working on campus. Why are you doing with a Haitian of six, seven, close to be six, eight, four, you know? Because, and I, don't, I barely know how to play the game. I came in, worked hard. I was at Union for five years. I didn't speak the language. They decided to work with me. And freshman year, I was okay. Sophomore year, I ended up in my third year at Union because they were shaped in my freshman year. I remember I walked into Coach Niven's office. I said, Coach, you guys not playing me a lot because I know basketball is it's my way out as well. Because Robert Joseph went pro. I want to be like Robert. Even though I know education is important for me, but if, if I just get the education, that's not going to be enough to win other Haitian kids over. Because the only way out was to sports for us. I went to coach coach said, Pierre, here's the thing. If you can outwork everybody at practice, if you can work extremely hard, I promise you, I will let you play to your mistakes. And the guy asked me to outwork some guy who can run 100 miles an hour. There was a guy on the team named Marcus Cooper. Marcus was like same height <coughs> as me, fast, I can't keep up. 
And guess what? I decided he put me on a program, lift before practice, lift after practice. And I think I'm, after I graduated at Union, I was a two times All American. I have a chance to go play professional basketball. I graduated and I said, I want to do something for Haiti. And coach was so excited because I never caused them any problem. Because I know for a fact, if I messed up, I'm closing that gate. And I was in situations where I have to, I have teammates that push me. I have guys to uh, that physically attack me at practice. I get up, one teammate one time punched me at practice. He say I elbow him because when I play, I always keep the elbows up. <laughs> but they told me, chain at everything. So get rebound, I elbow the guy, but I didn't do it by him. Mm -hmm. He was really upset, punched me extremely hard. I fell, I get up and I run to the other end. And coach went into his office and said, Pierre, if I was you, I will, he will attack Ben. I was like, coach, listen, if I punch him, I will be the last Asian here. And after I graduated, there were four Asian guys that graduated after me. And keep the story short, now we start bringing kids over from Haiti. Our country only have one basketball court, one inside court. We don't even have a real floor. If somebody didn't give me a chance, I would not be here talking to you guys today. I thought my nonprofit was special, but her idea is even bigger and greater. That's why I want to be a part of it. Because we bring kids over here on sports scholarship. I can guarantee you guys how many of these boys are going to go back and help. But when you're educating the people inside the country, education is the best gift. I feel like we are rebuilding Haiti right now by starting with that school. Think about it. Why not if somebody have to make me a vote for a Haitian politician, oh man, be my guest. I'm going to go against the guy. Because I know the guy is not qualified for the job. The Prime Minister of Sports don't know anything about sports. The, not, the guy who's responsible for, I mean, for agriculture or whatever, don't know nothing about agriculture. It's just about, I'm in and I bring my friends in and just, just like, let's walk the country together. That's the way it works. But to education, and the people who's doing that, I'm not judging them or blaming them. It's the system that they come in. I don't know if you guys ever heard about Baby Dog, Papa Dog. Haiti was in like 30 years of dictatorship. Then we get Aristide. How can judge a group of people who come for a system so corrupt? But if we find a way all together to give that school a chance, and we're gonna end up with a bunch of kids way smarter than me. Because I have a bunch of boys from the child. We have a young man right now named Jerry Baptiste. Today we FaceTime with him real quick. When I went to DJ this town, man, I know I was poor. But I'm not like DJ, man, what is going on here? There was nothing. If you want to work with something in, in that area, there was nothing to work with. DJ graduated from Vanderbilt after two years. Vendy. He's not getting his master's at UMass Amherst. I was extremely stressed last year, you know. I said, God, I'm gonna, I think this is too much. You have 50, 40 some kids in the country. You take on some of the stress. For them to succeed, you have to help some of the family members in Haiti. It's too much for me to handle. And while I'm sitting with DJ about to start his master's, and this guy's talking about, he's thinking about going to get his uh, PhD. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, hey, if I have to call one of you guys Dr. Baptist one day, I think I'm going to do this for another 20 years. <laughs> Here's the thing, now you have some of us dreaming. You know how impossible for me to be in Port au Prince, thinking about even going to college, getting my master's? You go up in a place, you're just a living being, but you feel like you're a nobody. Because Coach Nevi not give me that chance. I have learned so much from them. Now I feel like I'm somebody. I'm not the most organized guy in the world. The other day I asked God, with all the people you can pick or choose from this, why you pick me? Well, you know what? He put me in a great environment with great people. I have learned from these guys. I always tell people, this is the most philanthropic country I've ever seen in my life. I play in Europe, I have a lot of great Swiss friends, and, f and I have a lot of great friends who are from France. I always say, I'm gonna tell the Swiss guy to just uh, start helping me with this movement, when Haitian kids to Switzerland. I mean, there was no ghetto in Switzerland. You know, how are you gonna? But in America, I will find two or three kids in Haiti. We try to figure out, man, how are we gonna get help from them? And, 
you start telling people your story with the open arms, people are willing to help. Helping Mission of Hope is not just helping Miss Julie and, and everybody achieve their goals, it's actually helping us move forward. Here's the thing, I'm your neighbor. I'm only 700 miles away from Miami. The only way you can keep me out of here is to help me get an education. <laughs> because if we don't find something there, we're going to keep coming. And even though we're not living in my neighborhood, I don't want it to be overpopulated. You know? And that's the reason if you... It is... Here's the thing. I, I just, I'm a little bit speechless right now because... Can you imagine this is 2019, 2020, and you see places, people who are still living like this? When I came to America, when I end up in the middle of the reality of the American dream, you know, nice things, things we're doing for you. You go to the cafeteria, you have food three times a day. When I went home, oh my God, I used to live here. I went home after, two years after, you know, when I moved here, I went home. I can't believe I was still living in that, we were living in that condition. And after you're in, you're in, you're in the area, you spend, you're gonna spend a week, no electricity, you have to go get water somewhere. I don't have, I don't have the domes anymore. And if the people that help me, give me all this blessing, put me in a position to succeed, I think they will be happier to see me going back and do something. Now my program of 52 kids in the country on, on full scholarships, seven of them graduate from college. Well, here's the challenge that we have when we bring these boys over. They don't have, uh, they didn't have the proper education in Haiti. A school like Mission of Hope, the school that we're trying to put together, if, we, if I find a kid at the age of 12 or 13, send that kid there early, that can give them like a base to start with. Like, can you imagine like, I'm one of the kids in Haiti right now, they're thinking about, I might become a president one day. Like, it's, I hope the people know better than not try to put me out there right now because I'm still trying to figure out power forward. But, but here's the thing, it's like, the young man we spoke with today, DJ Baptist, I feel like I would vote for that kid. Give someone a chance. Sometimes you're helping a group of people you probably will never met in your life. Well, you never know. Maybe the next president, the guy that's going to fix that system, you never know. Might come from that school. One kid at a time. Remember, with the guy that helped me, I was the one kid that he helped. And now Haiti is the number one place in the Caribbean to go find some of these athletes. Mm -hmm. We have Haitian kids. I, I sit down with Kyle Perry. The other day, Penny Adoe called me. We have a young kid named Jetro. He said, Pierre yeah, Jetro. I would do a better job than Kansas, have him come to Memphis. Can you imagine nobody ever heard about us before? Now we're getting a phone call from Kyle Perry. Kansas is calling, Oklahoma is calling. It's like a dream come true for us. But I feel like education is the only way we can fix that country. And if it takes us 50 or 100 years, we're gonna start it with the, we're gonna start it somewhere. I'm not paying attention about what other people are doing in the island. We're gonna to try to run our own race, control what we can control, and move and help one kid at a time. Yeah. That was very, very uh, interesting, and yeah. heartfelt. Uh, I just forgot to mention um, we do have a ten thousand dollar match donation. So um, if we raise ten thousand um, dollars. Um, we will get matched $10,000, and that would be a good start for us to um, begin with the school. So I just